Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Sean O'Connor. I am the uh, Service Academy Coordinator for Congressman Norcross. Um, any questions that you might have during the course of this program, you can actually just save them to the end and we will uh, try our best to answer your question at the end of the program. Uh, first off tonight, I want to introduce uh, Congressman Donald Norcross. Sean, thank you and for what you've done for years now in helping to coordinate this program. And to those who are on the call tonight, welcome and thank you for attending what we call our Service Academy Information Day, or in this case, early evening. Each year, I literally have the honor to nominate what I call the best and brightest in South Jersey and the offer to attend our nation's most prestigious service academies. Well, as your representative, it is my duty and I have the responsibility to usher in that next generation of leaders who are committed to serving this great nation. If you choose to apply and receive an appointment, you'll receive education and training that is second to none literally in the world. And I want to thank our distinguished panel of admission advisors who you'll be hearing from shortly from the U.S. Military Academy the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy, the Merchant Marine Academy, and the Coast Guard Academy. Each of those have unique traits. And if you choose to want to apply to, apply to one of them, you will be very much impressed. And certainly just by showing up today, you're taking that first step. And again, we want to thank you for being with us today and the interest that you're showing in serving our country. For those of you who do decide to apply to our office for what we call the congressional nomination, we've created something called the Service Academy Selection Committee. We have some of those folks with us tonight. It's a group of past graduates of the different academies, public officials, and veterans. So the gentleman I'm going to introduce happens to be a US Army veteran who is a graduate of the U.S. Academy, Military Academy at West Point. He served in this position with us for over two decades. He has seen just about everything come across this Academy's desk, our selection committee. Uh, he understands what it's like to apply, to go to school, to serve in the military. And now he takes that experience and tries to help us pick out those special ones who are going to serve our nation. Please welcome John Denham. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Congressman. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of Congressman Norcross, the Service Academy Committee, uh, welcome everyone. And uh, like the Congressman said, it's a real privilege to see everyone take this first step, even if it's just to get some information or to go all the way and um, to do an application to one or more of the academies. We're really pleased to see you and to work with you. Um, I work with a very dedicated committee, as the Congressman said, coming from all walks of life. Uh, one of my colleagues on the committee, Carl Parker, you can see him on the screen, um, is a dedicated professional to this process. And it's a privilege to work with people like Carl um, as we sort through applications. Um, I will tell you that um, it's a privilege to work with the Congressman. He's dedicated to our men and women in uniform. Uh, he travels the world literally uh, visiting installations, uh, reviewing equipment and dealing with issues affecting our men and women in uniform. So it's a real privilege to work with someone with that background and dedication to the armed forces and also with the staff, uh, Sean O'Connor. Uh, spends numerous hours sifting through your applications, organizing them, uh, getting back to you where corrections or additional information may be needed. And um, uh, great thanks go out to Sean. So um, I'll stop there. I'll be glad to take some questions later, but I look forward to working with everyone on the call and uh, we remain available and at your service. Um, thank you, Congressman, and thank you, Sean. Thank, thank you, John. All so right. I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, run this program, who does an excellent job. We appreciate it, and you have a lot of eager ears. So the floor is now yours, Sean. All right. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, Carl Parker. He is also a member of the Congressman's Service Academy Committee. 
uh, he is in the audience with us today. Um, and with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with our first uh, speaker tonight. Uh, it's Henry Schwartzstein of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. So, uh, Henry, if you want to go ahead and share your screen with Absolutely. your presentation. Good evening, everyone. I'm a West Point grad, class of 1971. So usually when I'm on these programs, I'm the oldest one here, when that's okay. I'm going to try and get through this pretty quickly, Congressman. I want to thank the Congressman for support of the military and support of the academies, and you'll see that in a second, and Sean for putting this together. So what I'm going to review is the culture, the difference in the culture in the academies, go through the admissions process, how to earn an appointment, and the goal is being commissioned as an officer in the Army, obviously. So this is just a recap. Last year, we had 102 appointments in the state of New Jersey and 125 qualified students. The reason this is important, if you follow the roadmap we lay out, you have a good chance to get an appointment to the academy. Congressman, thank you. West Point has received $4 billion in infrastructure spending. All of you listening to this tonight or interested in West Point will benefit from this. We've had all the academic buildings are being upgraded. Uh, we have barracks that have been built. We have 138,000 square foot cyber center, which is a hole in the ground at the moment. Um, that's what the cyber center is going to look like. That's one of the barracks. They're redoing Camp Buckner for the uh, military training in the summertime. So West Point is spending a lot of money. The government has given the Army a lot of money to upgrade the academy. I'm going to cover the four pillars of the character development program. Um, first, in the academic pillar, West Point has 37 majors, the most of any of the academies. Importance on this slide over here on the right-hand side, you see that we have over a thousand summer internships. Uh, a lot of students do study a semester abroad. I'm gonna go into the scholarships quickly that students win at West Point, and the fact that West Point gets over $27 million to do research. And because there are no graduate students at the academy, the research is done by students. Now, in 2011 through 2021, West Point had 293 graduate scholarships. These are Rhodes, Marshall, Truman, GEM, and technical scholarships, as well as undergraduate scholarships. West Point has a special program, three courses. This course is taken as a sophomore yearling, a cow or a junior, and as a senior, to help prepare you for the different scholarships. This past year, West Point has four Rhodes and three Marshall Scholars. That's more than any Ivy League college university. West Point today is on a par with Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford. We also have cadets who have won technical scholarships, including Draper Labs, National Science Foundation, MIT, and Lincoln Labs. And here you can see the National Science Foundation winners, which is uh, six of them won these fellowships. You have the GEM scholarships for underrepresented groups. You have uh, five cadets who have earned Fulbright scholarships, and then you have the sophomore class, 12 cadets earn these STAM scholarships. So the opportunity for postgraduate research at the academy is really high. At the same time, I mentioned the summer internships, there are over a thousand of them each year. They're 100% funded by the academy in appropriations and donations. They support the army with cyber, the Pentagon, special forces, Congress, you can work in congressional offices, the FBI, you can do research at national laboratories. We send cadets to work on the National Security Council. One of the reasons you can do this and you can't do this in a regular college is all cadets have secret clearances. I know cadets have had their clearances upgraded to top secret to participate at the National Security Agency or the Cyber Command. It's not all military things. Cadets get a chance to go to England and study Shakespeare's war plays. They go to Oxford or they can go to Germany, just a small sampling, as well as working with the FBI Crisis Negotiation Unit. All right, different cultures. Each service has a different culture. My son wanted to follow my footsteps to West Point. I knew he wouldn't be happy at the academy, so I encouraged him to apply to the Merchant Marine Academy and Coast Guard. He's accepted of both. He went to the Merchant Marine Academy. He's currently a commander in the Navy Reserves and a harbor pilot. This is right from, uh, he's working on a second master's at the Air Command and Staff College. So you can see that the, each individual service has developed a very different ideas which strongly influence their cultures and behaviors. Obviously, the Air Force is focused on space in the air, Navy uh, on ships, and the Army is working with people. So uh, with the Army, you can deal with people more than equipment. You're gonna spend every summer in the field is more physical than the other academies. For example, 
Uh, West Point, you have to take a two mile run as opposed to a mile, a mile and a half run at the other academies. Four summers in field training, everybody has to take boxing, including women. You have to accept the army values and have to have a lot of grit. Reason this slot is important goes to the physicality. Again, everybody takes boxing. Everybody has to take a past survival swimming. Everybody has to take the indoor obstacle course. Everybody has to participate in athletics if you're not a D1 athlete. From the Commandant of Cadets, West Point wants warrior leaders of character who are physically fit and mentally tough. This is really an important slide. You need to ask this question of the other academies. What happens when you graduate? Graduate. This is a history all the different branches. People think everybody goes into the infantry when you graduate West Point, that's not correct. Only about 20% of the people go into infantry. This is really important. Engineers, when you graduate the academy, you can go into the Corps of Engineers or into the Combat Engineers. Corps of Engineers handles a lot of the infrastructure projects around the country. Military intelligence, you can see there are 70 slots last year in military intelligence. Cyber, West Point has last three years, put 40 people into the cyber branch, ordinance, quartermaster, transportation, MPs, medical service, adjutant general, chemical and finance. So you need to find out what happens when you graduate from the academies and what branch you're going into, what you can do with your degree. Some of the things that you learn at the different academies, you're going to fail and fail frequently because you've never done things that the academy is going to ask you to do. And that's important. You're going to learn that only thing that matters is the size of your heart, that life isn't unfair, and that's how you handle adversity, that character is relevant to everything you do, that grit makes the difference and never, ever quit. So you need to accept this if you're going to go to the academies. On When it comes to your, uh, your application, you need to be proactive and aggressive, listen to us in the field force. West Point has the most transparent of all the academies in the system. It's we tell you exactly how you earn points, they're 8,000 points, 60% academic, 30% leadership, and 10% the CFA. So your GPA is 30%, SAT, ACT tests are 30%, extracurricular activities are 800 points, athletic participation, 800, your teacher evaluations, 800, and then the CFA, as I mentioned, 10%. So you have to be a leader in your different activities, boys state and girls state is worth a lot of points. You, West Point super score, so it doesn't matter how many times you take the SAT, ACT, it's important. You have to disregard the class profile because that's not important. It has to do with how you earn the principal or the number one appointment in the district. Math scores are worth more than English scores. Math is 60% of the composite score. You need scores, you need to strive for scores around 1400 in the SAT with math over 700 and ACT 31 with math over 31. All right, when it comes to the congressional silo, you need to apply obviously for, for the congressman, for the two senators and for the vice president, you should apply for every congressional nomination that's available. When it comes to the service connected, you need to apply for all of them also. This past year, we had two students whose fathers had uh, been career army officers and we didn't find out till near the very end that that was true. We encouraged them to apply for the presidential nominations and they got the presidential appointments, even though they had also tried for the congressional, but they couldn't earn the congressional, they did earn the presidential. That's why this is an important silo. All right, different ways to win an appointment to the academy is being the vacancy winner. It's either a principal and competitive, and most of the congressional districts in the state use the competitive method. Whoops. Number two is very important. The reason we stress the 1400 plus SAT scores that Congress has passed under Title 10 the law says that the academies must take the top 150 candidates off the national wait list by a whole candidate score or by their order of merit. We talked about LOAs. The LOA window opens up from around the middle August to mid September. All those who are applying to West Point have attended our briefings have heard about that. There are also limited civil prep scholarships. A lot of students reapply from college because you can receive bonus points. There are class composition goals and service connected, as we said. Use maps, generally you have to have an academic risk to go to the prep school. Take a picture of this. Everybody has to, has to be qualified medically. Um, <clears throat> Dahmer's website, these will answer a lot of your questions and this DOD 6130.03 details what the medical qualifications are. Uh, second step kit just opened up on June 1st. We have a briefing on Monday night at seven o'clock. So those of you interested in West Point, you should uh, go to that briefing, you should have received the logon instructions for it already. 
it's important that you get your candidate statements in early so that you can be qualified to take the medical exam. Last, I wanna say that it's important that you apply for ROTC scholarships. Every interviewer asks you if you've filled out an application for ROTC, it goes to intent to serve. You're gonna be generally asked this question, not only by the field force people, but it pretty much applies for the other academies too. And also the congressional committees ask this. You need to prepare for all interviews. You need to take and pass the CFA early so you can qualify for an LOA. That increased score may make a difference. We recommend taking the medical early because no one takes the medical in the summertime. That way you can get cleared. And if you have any issues, you have plenty of time to address them. Recommend completing your file by August 1st. That's to com compete for an LOA. And certainly before the congressional interviews, because it's much more impressive to the congressional committees. If they know that you've completed the interview, it's easier to select the person that they know is already qualified than a person who isn't qualified. And with that, I'll turn it back to Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Henry. All right. Next up tonight, we have um, Paul Fleistra. He is a blue and gold officer with the U.S. Naval Academy. So, Paul, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. All right, good evening, everyone. My name's uh, Paul Filstra. I'm a Naval Academy graduate from 2006, so just about 10 years ago, I was in uh, your seat learning about this process. Um, as Sean said, I'm a blue and gold officer. So I, uh, I'm a volunteer and I help all the Naval Academy uh, applicants who are in South Jersey. So that's area 114. Um, and if you need it, my email's there if you'd like to reach out. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, the United States Naval Academy today and a little bit about that application process that we just hear about. Um, some highlights, United States Naval Academy is Hold on located... one second, Paul. Sorry oh. to cut you off. Were you sharing your screen or do you have yes, a PowerPoint? Is it, okay. Is it not no, coming we, we across? We can't see it on our end. Oh, my apologies. Let's try that again. Sure. Is it working now? Yeah, we can see it. All right, sorry about that. So, um, some highlights for the Naval Academy. Um, mm -hmm. It's located in Annapolis, Maryland, which is about 45 minutes away from Baltimore and 45 minutes away from Washington, DC on the, the great Chesapeake Bay. We have 20 academic majors. Most are gonna be STEM focused. You're gonna find a lot of engineering majors, also a lot of, we'll call them science and math, and there are some of your normal liberal arts majors as well. Um, and even if you take one of those liberal arts majors, you're going to get a very engineering centered uh, education, as we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, there's a ton of varsity division one sports. Um, if you're not a uh, complete athlete, we also have a ton of club sports, intramural sports. Um, no matter what you pick to play, you will be participating in at least one sport each semester, um, whether that's just with your company playing after the academic day or participating in Division I, you will stay very active. There's also a ton of extracurricular activities to take place with, um, whether they're culture-centered, music, um, service academy oriented, religious, military professionalism, there's almost a ton of them. And if you have an idea, Generally speaking, the Naval Academy will consider it and allow you to start a new club. There's lots of international experiences, whether you're going to do a semester abroad or through summer training. The Academy sends people, um, you might do a semester with uh, the English Naval Academy, and there's many opportunities around. And we're going to talk a little bit about paying benefits. Um, while you're attending any of the service academies, you're actually considered part of the military. So you do receive pay and benefits that go along with that. Um, this is just a snapshot of the core curriculum that you'd be taking while you're at the Naval Academy. Um, the courses highlighted in blue are gonna be things that are 
kind of Navy centric, whether you're taking a leadership course, course on navigation, or first class year, you'll take a course that's going to help you out in whatever service you select. So if you're going to be a pilot, you're going to take a course on being a pilot. You have some core uh, courses you're going to take that are very engineering centric, whether they're math courses, chemistry, you could take some classes on weapons engineering, naval engineering. No matter what you take, you're going to have a very strong background in engineering when you graduate from Naval Academy. And then you take um, some of your more traditional classes while you're there too. English, their civilization, um, you're going to have a couple electives in there. And then you'll see um, some of the white boxes are going to be where your major courses are going to fit in. Um, one thing to take about this, you're going to be very busy at your time at the academy. I, I could tell you from many of my years, I was 20 to 22 credit hours. So you stay very busy academically while you're there. Just to give you an idea of a daily schedule in the life of a midshipman, uh, about 5.30, you're going to wake up for personal conditioning. You may be uh, just deciding to go by run on yourself, or you may run with your entire company that morning. It's going to change day to day, but you're going to be up pretty early. Um, once you get done with that, you're going to get ready for your morning formation at about 7. So every day you're going to meet up with your company. So that's a core group of people, um, about 40 from each class that you'll stay with all your years. And uh, so they'll put out anything for the day. Then you'll go down to breakfast. Um, breakfast and lunches every day, you're going to be eating family style um, with your squad and many days in dinner. So you get to know uh, these people very well. You form some great bonds with them. And through the day, you're going to have your academic periods. Um, your last class will probably be about four o'clock. That's when you're going to be doing your athletic period, whether you're a division one athlete or working on that club or just intramurals. Um, at night, you're going to have some dinner. And then from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m., you're going to have study period. Each summer, the academy is going to split your summer basically into thirds. Um, you're going to look at four weeks. So starting out, uh, you're, you're going to do plebe summer for eight years or eight weeks. And then your other years, you're going to have experiences that um, let you go out into the Navy and um, experience it from an enlisted point of view, from an officer point of view, and then give you also a wide idea of every, all of the opportunities that are throughout the Navy. So in the career exposure, you're going to do a week with aviation, a week with submarines, a week with the Marine Corps and a week on a sailing ship. And then also you're going to be doing various uh, leadership development while you're there. Um, so your sophomore year, you may start out as just someone on a sailboat and then you can work your way up. So you may be in charge by your first class summer. You may be going out and you may be in charge of that sailboat and sailing from maybe Annapolis to Newport, Rhode Island. Everyone uh, that graduates from the Naval Academy is going to graduate with a Bachelor of Science. So that's whether you're a engineering degree or an English degree, you're going to end up with a Bachelor of Science. You're going to be a commissioned as an officer in the United States Navy or in the Marine Corps, and you're going to go owe a minimum of five-year service commitment. Um, that commitment will change a little bit based on what you select. Um, service commissioning opportunities. There's a wide variety of opportunities in the Navy. You can go surface warfare, which would be on a ship. Um, submarine warfare, which is you're going to be officer on submarines. Aviation, there's both opportunities to fly an airplane and then also opportunities to be a naval flight officer, which it could be on a P-8 doing some sort of surveillance or being in the backseat of an F-18. There's special warfare, which could be Navy SEALs, EOD, and there's another couple of other opportunities in there. And then also Marine Corps, um, up to 33% of the Marine Corps or the Naval Academy can select Marine Corps for their service selection. And then even within the Marine Corps, you can either go ground and you have quite a few opportunities there, or you can fly with the Marine Corps. And then fairly recently, um, the Navy has started commissioning officers into cyber warfare as that area becomes more and more important. Application process just uh, looks similar to the other service academies, but you're going to need a personal statement. Um, this is really so that the board can get to know you. Um, list of activities, 
Um, you're going to need some letters of recommendation from math teacher, English teacher, and then one other person that knows you well. Your transcripts, official SAT or ACT scores. You're going to take that candidate fitness test. And then you also have to get qualified by the DOD MERB board. And then finally, you'll need a nomination. So uh, through the missions process, you'll enter a preliminary application. Once you do that, you'll become an official candidate. You should be assigned a candidate number. And then um, you need to get your package together. So that would be the admissions board, kind of the second piece of that. You have to be physically qualified. Then you also have to become medically qualified. And then once you have all of those, um, you also need to obtain a nomination. Um, if you don't have one of any of those four items, um, you can't get an appointment to the Naval Academy or any of the other service academies. Um, the Naval Academy does have an option. So sometimes the board will look at a student and say that, hey, I think they have a whole lot of leadership and maybe they're just missing something. Maybe for whatever reason, you just might need a little brushing up on your English or maybe some math. So if that might be the case. Um, they may, instead of giving you a direct application to the Naval Academy, they may suggest that you go to one of the Naval Academy preparatory schools. So there is the Naval Academy Preparatory School up in Newport, Rhode Island, or there's a number of foundation programs at um, schools across the nation. And um, this, you'll automatically be given um, acceptance to one of these prep schools as part of your application if they feel that you are a promising candidate, but you just need a little bit more help in an area to make sure that you succeed at the academy. Um, here's a number of just our, the website to go to. And I just want to put out um, Martha's name here. So she's the Area 114 coordinator. Um, if you have any questions, um, she's been doing this a long time. You can email myself or you can email Martha. She's a wealth of knowledge and I know she loves helping people out. And uh, Sean, back to you. All right. Thank you, Paul. Let me figure out. Just... Yeah, you just gotta um, stop sharing your screen, Paul. There we go. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, all right, next up tonight, we have our Air Force Academy admissions representative, uh, Second Lieutenant Derek Dye. So if you wanna go ahead and share your screen, and go ahead and present. All right, can everybody hear me? Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can hear you and see your screen, yep. Awesome, uh, yeah, so real quick background on me. My name is Second Lieutenant Derek Dye. I am a recent graduate of the United States Air Force Academy. Not the most recent, uh, class of 22 graduated last week. Uh, so they're pretty excited. They're starting their 60 days of leave that you get once you graduate a service academy. Uh, and then they'll be they'll be headed out to, to the Air Force and the Space Force here the next, next coming months. So I'm um, gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, the Air Force Academy. Um, I'm gonna try to not to say some of the same things that uh, the other representatives already said. I'm gonna try to, to stick to what keeps um, the Air Force is uh, different than, than the other service academies. So uh, why the Air Force Academy? Well, uh, here, here's a couple of reasons. Uh, one is the number three public college in the United States. Uh, sixth for electrical engineering, undergraduate engineering, uh, seventh for civil engineering and computer engineering, as well as uh, 10th for mechanical engineering. So similar to the other service academies, uh, every cadet will get a bachelor's of science degree uh, from the academy. It uh, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter on, on what degree plan you take. Um, we also do have that number 39 ranked best national liberal arts school in the United States. Uh, which is issue because not many people think that the liberal arts are in the service academies that it's all about STEM technology engineering. Um, but it's not true. Um, I actually got my degree in philosophy, uh, which I got a bachelor's of science in philosophy. Uh, one of my friends also got his his bachelor's degree bachelor's of science in English. Um, and something that's something that's awesome about that. Uh, I'll just highlight kind of from the beginning. So you can tell I'm wearing my flight seat tonight. Uh, I'm going to be an Air Force pilot when I graduate, or sorry, once once I'm finished uh, recruiting. 
Um, it doesn't matter what degree plan you get from the academy, any degree you, you get, you can go on to be an Air Force pilot. So if you're interested in being a pilot, uh, but you don't think that you, you know, you don't want to be an electrical engineer or, or something like that, any of these, uh, any of these different degree plans you, you can get and still become a pilot, which is uh, something that's, that's really awesome. I had no, no flying experience, no background, uh, anything like that. Um, getting a degree in philosophy, like I said, it gets me fully qualified and ready to be ready to be uh, an Air Force pilot, which is awesome. Um, so we have the basic sciences, engineering, humanities, social sciences, uh, as well as eight different foreign languages you can get a minor in. Uh, <clears throat> there's Spanish, French, Portuguese, German, Arabic, um, Chinese, Japanese, as well as Russian. Uh, eight different foreign languages you can you can get your uh, get a minor in, um, which is really awesome. And I'll talk a little bit later about um, some traveling opportunities that that you can do with uh, you can you can do with your language, which is pretty cool. Another really big thing about the Air Force Academy is is athletics, sports. Uh, everybody loves sports. Um, the Air Force Academy has twenty four different NCAA Division One sports teams. 24 NCAA Division One sports teams. 14 of them are for men, and then uh, 10 of them are for women. And just in this picture that you can see, uh, you have uh, men's baseball, men's lacrosse, men's football. Uh, you can't see in the picture, it's kind of a little off to the side, but men's and women's soccer. Uh, you can see the tennis courts there, men's and women's tennis. There's men's and women's track and field, indoor and outdoor, men's and women's basketball, men's ice hockey, women's volleyball, uh, men's and women's fencing, men's and women's boxing. Uh, you have men's and women's gymnastics, men's and women's fencing, men's and women's uh, air rifle. Uh, I think that's all of them. I don't, men's and women's gymnastics. I might have said that one or not, I don't remember. Uh, but a lot of different sports. Uh, and if you're not interested or maybe you aren't an athlete, you can still join one of those sports. Um, so I had, I played a little soccer and basketball in high school, but I knew that I wasn't going to, knew that I wasn't going to play um, competitively in college. Um, so what I ended up doing was join the managerial staff for the team. So I still got to go down to the practices. I helped run practice. I still got all the team gear, uh, all of the t-shirts that I, all the t-shirts that I wear all say Air Force volleyball on them. Uh, they give us all kinds of free, oh, I don't know if you can see that or not. Oh, maybe not. My background's kind of messing up. All kinds of all kinds of free gear you can you can get. Um, my my wardrobe is almost ninety percent Air Force Air Force gear. Um, it's a lot of what I wear to the gym, all that kind of stuff. So it's really awesome. And the best part about joining a team at the academy, um, any of the service academies you go to, uh, everybody will tell you it, it's a difficult task. Uh, but the best part about teams is having having a different having a support system. Uh, all the different service academies, when you get there, you're going to get assigned to a different squadron or battalion. Uh, you know, you're going to get assigned to, to different uh, pods of, of people. Uh, and you're going to have a, a built in support system right there. But joining a sports team, whether you're a player, manager, something like that, you're going to have a different opportunity for other support systems that you probably wouldn't already be able to, uh, you probably wouldn't interact with on, on a regular basis, um, which is, which is uh, really awesome. Uh, big majority of my friends are, are from the volleyball team, as well as the people who I lived in the dorms with. Um, so sports, sports are, are very, very, very good opportunity. Clubs are another really awesome thing you, do, you can do at the academy. Uh, here's just a small list of some of the clubs that we have, but uh, there's over a hundred different uh, cadet clubs that you can get involved with. And if you don't, if the academy doesn't have the club you're looking for, uh, you can actually go and create create your own club. Uh, my roommate, actually, my senior year, my uh, first year, uh, he actually created the Yusafa Powerlifting Club. He had a CrossFit club, um, but he wasn't really interested in CrossFit. He was looking more more into powerlifting. They didn't have a powerlifting club, so he actually went started the powerlifting club and the academy paid to send them around to different powerlifting collegiate level powerlifting competitions, uh, which is really awesome. Uh, there's some, some club athletic teams. If you don't want to play at the division one level, but you still want to play a sport, 
you can play in one of the uh, traveling competitive club teams. While I was at the prep school, I was part of the uh, competitive traveling soccer club. Uh, so we played some of the local universities. We actually won a tournament uh, up in Denver. Um, so it's pretty cool. Uh, still, again, another opportunity to play your sport, even if you don't have the ability to dedicate uh, as much time as it takes to be an NCAA athlete. Uh, a couple other, a couple other clubs. I'll just highlight real quick. Uh, Falconry. Falconry is one of, is a amazing opportunity that you really can't get anywhere else. Um, what they do is they are solely responsible for taking care of the mascots at the academy, the live birds of prey that the academy has. We have about 20 birds of prey that, that uh, the academy houses on campus and they get to take care of them. Uh, they take them to take them to class, take them to schools for recruiting events, take them to all the football games, things like that. Um, a lot of these birds that's actually illegal to own for a private citizen, uh, the academy actually has the ability to have them and you can learn to take care of them. Uh, really awesome opportunity. Um, like I said, uh, a lot of different sports teams, as well as affinity clubs like the Black Student Union. Uh, you can see on, on the screen here, Pacific Rim is the, uh, the Asian and Pacific Islanders Club. Um, a lot of different opportunities to get involved. And like I said, having support systems, people who are interested in the same thing or uh, you identify with, with, with each other for, you know, um, uh, one thing or another, uh, uh, different opportunities to connect with other cadets and, and build your support systems, which is really great. Uh, I talked about traveling a little bit with your with your 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 uh, foreign language you might want to take. Um, so you can do uh, this picture in the far left for an exchange. You can actually go for a semester to uh, another service academy around around the world. Um, I know some people have kind of already talked about it a little bit, but uh, you can go, like I said, six months, spend at a different service academy to see how the Brazilian Air Force uh, Academy is like or the Colombian Air Force Academy, things like that. If you aren't interested in going to one of their service academies, you can do a language immersion, which will you'll go to a civilian university in one of those in one of those uh, foreign countries and you'll be able to study full time in in your foreign language, uh, which is really awesome. Something that doesn't take uh, a, a foreign language to do is a service academy exchange. Uh, it might seem like a foreign language. Uh, you know, some of the different military branches have different words for things. Like I might say bathroom or latrine and uh, somebody in the Navy, Marine Corps might say the head. Uh, so there might be a little bit of a language barrier when you get there, but I'm sure you will. I'm sure you'll, you'll figure it out. Uh, ROTC exchanges as well. You can spend a semester at a service academy or, or one of the ROTC units around the United States. Cultural immersions are another really awesome opportunity for travel, and those don't include any kind of uh, language. Um, so when I was a junior, I was scheduled to go to the Denmark Air Force Academy for spring break. We were going to go over there, uh, check out Denmark, the Netherlands. We were going to tour their, their service academy and do a little bit of sightseeing, things like that. Um, unfortunately, uh, COVID-19 ended up canceling, uh, canceling a lot of those trips, which I was really sad about. Uh, and then also later that year over the summer, I was going to spend three weeks in Tanzania in Eastern Africa. Uh, we were going to go on safari, hike Mount Kilimanjaro, um, we'll look at the lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Uh, just going out to the world, uh, seeing what, what the world is like, experiencing a different culture. Uh, again, cancer due to COVID, which is which is really sad. But the overall best opportunity that you have at the Academy for traveling is Operations Air Force, that picture there on the right. Uh, so Ops Air Force is uh, similar to some of the other service academies. You get to go to an Air Force base and you will uh, job shadow for about two weeks over the summer. Uh, you, go to some, you go to talk to different officers about officership, about their careers, uh, how they take care of their airmen, uh, things like that. But a big part of Ops Air Force is getting uh, the experience to fly an, an aircraft. Uh, when I was in, when I was doing my ops experience, I got to fly four different times. Uh, Tuesday, I got to fly in a C-130, which is a cargo plane. On uh, Wednesday, I got to fly in a little civilian skydiving plane, and I actually got to go skydiving with special operations uh, personnel. They were training how to skydive with another human body attached to them, and so I got to go hang out for free and go skydiving. 
Uh, the next day on Thursday, I got to fly on a four hour flight in an H860 rescue helicopter uh, where they we flew out into the desert. We practiced uh, like we had to go pick up a, a wounded soldier. And like I said, I got to fly around for four hours in, in a helicopter. And that's what drew me to become wanting to be a helicopter pilot. And that's what shaped my future, my career later on down the road. And then on Friday, I got to fly in an F-16 fighter jet. I got about an hour flight. I pulled eight G's. And that's something that told me, hey, your body doesn't like pulling G's. I got sick. I needed to use my uh, barf bag. A um, little graphic, but uh, there's something that taught me, hey, Derek, I know you want to fly, but you probably don't want to be a fighter pilot. I said, hey, you know, body, good idea. I'll stick with the helicopter. Uh, and that was a really awesome experience because not many people can say that they had some of those experiences. And that's something that you can really only get on, on Ops Air Force, which is really awesome. And then summer research, uh, like some of the other guys we talked about, um, able to go uh, work with uh, congressional members or um, different government or organizations. Uh, we've had some cadets. This cadet got to work with Chick-fil-A uh, for, for a summer doing, doing uh, uh, research with uh, uh, one of a, a local business, or I guess not a local business, but a pretty famous business. Uh, we've had people work at, at SpaceX, SpaceX and Tesla, um, real innovator, innovators in the technology world. A lot of different opportunities uh, at a service academy. Aviation obviously is a really big part of the Air Force Academy. Uh, every cadet at the academy is going to experience some type of airmanship, uh, whether it's uh, the skydiving program, the sailing program, the RPA program, or, or the space program. Uh, after your freshman year, uh, your four degree year, um, about a third of the class is gonna do the skydive program where you get five solo free falls out of an airplane and the Air Force will give you your, your jump wings to put on your uniform that you get to wear for the rest of your career. Uh, another thing you can do is the glider program. You get about 14 flights in a glider where you learn the basics of aviation, yaw, pitch, roll, uh, thrust, you get to uh, understand the dynamics of flying, uh, what thermals do, things like that, what turbulence is, gives you the, the real core down and dirty basics of aviation. Uh, and if you don't choose to not do any of those programs, you can do the RPA program where you uh, get to experience, find some drones and you get to, to get to work uh, with those weapon systems, which is also an another really awesome opportunity. And the Air Force Academy actually was the first institution, the first uh, institution of higher learning in the United States that was able to build a completely cadet or student built satellite, get it launched into space and is actually active today run by cadets, um, which is really awesome. Uh, they call it Falcon Sat, and that's, uh, like I said, an active satellite in orbiting the world that uh, cadets are able to able to uh, operate, uh, which is another really awesome membership that you can do. About 35 different career, career fields in, in the Air Force and the Space Force. Uh, the Air Force Academy is directly commissioning lieutenants into the Space Force. Uh, the class of 2020, the class before me, graduated about 100 cadets and directly uh, commissioned into the Space Force. My class did the same thing. I'm not sure about the most recent class, but it's looking at a, about 10% uh, 10 of a graduating class will go to the Space Force. About 50% of the class will become Air Force pilots. And then 10% of the class has the opportunity to go on and get their graduate school paid for, get a master's degree or uh, a medical degree, whether it's like your uh, uh, go to medical school, dental school, uh, physical therapy, stuff like that. Um, a lot of different op opportunities for, uh, for higher education uh, coming out of a military academy as well. Couple of different jobs that you can do. Um, a lot, a lot of good, a lot of good opportunities. The ones in the far left, you have uh, more than a five-year service commitment based on uh, going to a service academy. Pilots, there's a ten-year service commitment. Uh, uh, remotely piloted aircraft pilots, navigators, uh, air battle managers, you have a seven-year service commitment. And if you go on to be a doctor, a dentist, or a lawyer, that could add on some some additional additional time. Uh, but the ones in the middle, they don't have any additional additional uh, service commitment. You can do those jobs for uh, five years and then get out of the military and go work on, on a civilian career. Uh, call that the five and dive. Um, any of those jobs like in the middle, like I said, uh, it doesn't matter. You everyone will have a five year service commitment. But if you do want one of the jobs on uh, the far right uh, operations research analysis or any of the uh, engineerings, uh, you, you will have to have a specific degree in order to, to get one of those jobs at the Air Force. So that's just kind of for your situational awareness. If you're interested in being a, a chemist or a physicist, something like that, uh, you have to get that specific degree, which is uh, just kind of good knowledge to have in the back of your head.
And then the Space Force, like I said, uh, here's a couple different opportunities you can do acquisitions, engineering, space operator, uh, cyberspace, uh, or intelligence. Um, if you're interested at all in the Space Force, those are, those are uh, the jobs that, they are, that the Space Force is hiring for right now. How to get started? Um, academymissions.com. If you just finished your junior year in high school, uh, the application is open to you. Uh, you'll fill out the pre candidate questionnaire. Um, the application is completely online. Uh, it's a really good opportunity. Um, I think the rest of my slideshow is some of the stuff that's already been already been been covered by some of the other guys. Uh, academically competitive, physically qualified, medically qualified. Um, demonstrate good character and leadership, as well as getting a nomination from your your congressional sources. Um, so if you guys uh, if you have any questions for me, I'll, I'll hang it at the at the end of the presentation, and then I'll I'll try to uh, to answer any questions you guys have. All right, thank you, Derek. All right, next up tonight, we have uh, Lieutenant Commander Joseph Becker of the US Merchant Marine Academy. Um, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. Absolutely. Okay, good evening, good evening. Uh, hey, Sean, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear okay, you. Okay, perfect, perfect. Right, good evening, everyone. My name is Lieutenant Commander Joe Becker. I'm the, am I sharing screen? Yep, I can see it, yeah. Oh, it's only one slide. Okay. That's fine. Fantastic. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lieutenant Commander Joe Becker. I'm the Northeast Regions Admissions Officer with the United States Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, just to talk, talk about the Academy tonight. Uh, quick disclaimer I am not a graduate of the Academy. I actually uh, completed ROTC at SUNY Maritime. I was commissioned Naval Officer in 2008, as, as well as received my deck officer's license. So the moral of the story there is twofold is hey, if you're, if you're looking at the Academies, uh, definitely explore all your options. Explore, you know, if you're applying to one, consider applying to all of them, as well as considering to apply to ROTC as well. Uh, so that's where that's where Merchant Marine Academy comes in. Uh, question I get all the time is Merchant Marine Academy, who are you? What are you doing here? Um, understand the Merchant Marine Academy, don't think of it so much as a branch of the military. It's really not. It's, it's a civilian career field, maritime shipping, the maritime industry. But it does have a, an inherent defense mission. Uh, we're the only academy that has a dual mission for national defense, as well as uh, transportation and supporting the economy. And I'd argue if, you know, if we, we want to have a strong military that's able to project our power and defend our interests, uh, we do need to have a robust economy and we do need to have defined uh, transportation infrastructure. And uh, the Merchant Marine Academy supports both those missions. Uh, we're located in Kings Point, New York, which is uh, just right outside New York City. We're on the North Shore of Long Island, uh, beautiful scenic, scenic campus. Um, this is a very STEM focused school. We have five majors in total, uh, two within marine transportation, three within marine engineering. Uh, so if you love math and sciences, you like being a problem solver, you like work with your hands, this would be a great, great fit for you. Um, I'd encourage you to jump online, check out our website. There's a lot of great videos on YouTube, uh, social media, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but there's a few other things I do want to highlight. Um, understand Merchant Marine Academy, uh, for starters, we're a Division Three athletics program. Uh, so if you're looking to play a sport in the collegiate level, uh, definitely check us out. Uh, for the size of our school, we're the smallest of the academies between us and Coast Guard. Uh, we battle every year for who's the smallest. But um, understand we're a pretty competitive program, so definitely check us out. Um, very similar requirements to the other academies as far as academics, uh, leadership, uh, extracurricular activities, so on and so forth. Um, probably the biggest difference in our in our selection process is the CFA is uh, strictly pass fail. Uh, as long as you pass the CFA, we don't care how fast or how many pushups you do, uh, that'll get you in. The check mark, good to go. Uh, but also the nomination process is very different than the other academies. We do require a nomination. Uh, however, I would argue that uh, Kings Point is probably the more most favorable to the applicant. Uh, in the sense that when, when we make our selections, we select by the state as a whole, not by the individual district. Uh, so if you're if you're in a district with a lot of competitive candidates, uh, we'll take multiple candidates from the same district. New Jersey tends to perform pretty well every year uh, in the in the grand scheme of things. You got a lot of great schools, there are a lot of great programs. So keep up, keep doing what you're doing there. Um, our application has it's already on, it's already open. I'd encourage you to start as soon as possible. Um, I've been doing this job for about five years now. I've been working at the academy for ten years, and uh, the one constant is uh, this is a time-driven process. 
this, you definitely want to apply as soon as possible. The sooner you start, the sooner you finish, uh, the more feedback we can provide you on your application. And uh, most of the academies, we all, we work on kind of a rolling deadline. So if you turn everything in, you're hot to try, you're a competitive candidate, yeah, we, we may float you an early offer, uh, a letter of, letter of assurance, letter of intent. And that, uh, that guarantees your spot provided you do what we tell you in the end of the letter. Um, probably the biggest uh, requirement that a lot of candidates overlook, and I can't stress this enough, is your medical. That's through Dodmer. That's the Department of Defense Medical Examination Review Board. Uh, understand the medical examination is no joke. It's pretty thorough. It's not a medical examination that can be performed by your school nurse or your pediatrician. You do have to use the Dodmer contracted uh, doctors. And, um, you know, what's good about Dodmerb, they have physicians in your local area, you punch in your zip code, they'll tell you who the provider is. Uh, but there is some turnaround time required for those those medical examinations. And we've seen that repeatedly year in, year out. Uh, candidates are late to the game, they apply late, or they, they start their medical application late. And uh, that that really uh, delays them or sometimes outright, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, we, we can't provide them provide them an, op, an appointment. Uh, because their, their medical wasn't uh, qualified. So we encourage you, the sooner you can start that is typically late August, early September. Uh, so it's incumbent upon you to, hey, start your application early, whether it's our academy or the other academies, start your application early. Uh, Dodmerb is universal. So if you take Dodmerb once, it, it's, it's shared across the board for all the academies. Um, the other point I'll, I, drive, I would uh, drive home tonight is, hey, is if you're in a situation where you're applying to the academies, our academy, another program doesn't make a difference. If you're unsuccessful, uh, we encourage you to reapply. Um, typically in a given class, 20 to 25% of the students that we accept every year will be transfer students. Um, so let's yeah, just keep that in mind. It's not a death sentence by any means if you're not accepted. It's not the end of the world. Uh, definitely recommit yourself, reapply. Uh, consider going to one of the prep schools, a junior college, another four-year college. Uh, they're all great. I'm not going to tell you one's better than the other one, uh, but definitely... Uh, uh, consider reapplying. Uh, final point for King's Point. Uh, one of the things that makes us very, very unique and very, very special is following graduation. Just like all the other academies, you do incur a service obligation, but what makes King's Point unique is how you satisfy the obligation. Uh, King's Point's very unique in the sense that when you graduate, you have a choice of going uh, into the maritime field, public sector, private sector, we don't care, get a job. Uh, you'll, you'll also serve in the Navy Reserve. It's an eight-year commitment. Uh, likewise, if you choose to go active duty military, it's a five-year commitment. You go to any branch of the military you choose. Uh, we're the only academy that offers the option of going active duty or reserve service. And if you own reserve service, going to work in the public sector, or the private sector. So the options and opportunities you, know, you have at Kings Point um, is probably our biggest selling point as compared to the other programs. And yeah, we encourage you to check them, test drive them all, check them all out. Uh, come visit us. We'd love to have you. We host visits three times a week on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. And uh, yeah, uh, my, my contact information is on the page here. Feel free to reach out to myself, our admissions team. We're here to help you. And uh, like I said, apply early, apply often. And the sooner you start, the sooner you finish, the more help we can provide to you. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it back over to Sean. All right. Thank you, Joe. All right. Uh, next up, we have the um, U.S. Coast Guard Academy, represented by Lieutenant Frederick Scott. Uh, we also have the local representatives on the call as well, uh, Deanna and Mark Murdy. Hey, good evening, everybody. Sorry, it took me a second there to unmute my mic. Sean, thank you very much. Can you hear me and see my uh, PowerPoint all right? Yep, I can hear and see everything, yep. All right. Awesome. Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Lieutenant Rick Scott or Frederick Scott. Uh, when you're emailing me, uh, you'll, you'll need to do that. But I just put my contact info in the uh, in the chat so you can feel free to use that as well as a link that I'll reference later on. So my role with the admissions process is I'm the Mid-Atlantic Admissions Officer. So I'm your, your main point of contact in the admissions office in New London, Connecticut for the Coast Guard Academy. When it comes to everything Coast Guard, Coast Guard Academy admissions, your application, I will be the one doing the initial review on your file. So I look forward to working with you all. So I tell a lot of people that are looking at, uh, you know, one of the service academies, usually they're looking at multiple and that's fine because what has been said is that they're all fantastic opportunities. The most important thing that I share with students and families is thinking about what happens on, on day one after graduation. At the end of the day, your experience at a lot of these academies are, are, are gonna be probably pretty similar. You're gonna be marching to class. You're definitely gonna be wearing a uniform. It's gonna be pretty regimented. 
What really makes the difference is what happens on that day one when you take on that leadership role within your service. So what I like to spend a good amount of my time with these presentations is just sharing a little bit about what the Coast Guard is and what that mission is that you're doing with our fine service. So the Coast Guard is a little different from the other branches of the military and that we are not part of the Department of Defense. We fall under the Department of Homeland Security. However, we are a branch of the U.S. military. And until the Space Force came along, you know, we were uh, the smallest uh, service, but they might be uh, taking that one from us. The Coast Guard, and we'll talk a little bit about career paths towards the end of the presentation. While you can do a lot of the things you get to do with the, the DOD branches, at the end of the day, the Coast Guard is a humanitarian force. We focus on saving lives and preserving the safety of life at sea. That day in, day out, since we were conceived as the, the, the oldest uh, continuous serving sea service, that has been our mission, is preserving the safety of life at sea. So if that's a mission you can get behind, then by all means, this is be a great service for you. So quick eligibility requirements for the Coast Guard Academy and, and, and similar to the others, be a US citizen, unmarried, no dependents or financial debt and between the ages of 17 and 22 uh, when you enroll. And then finally, obviously be a high school graduate or GED recipient, which I'm sure if you're on the call tonight, you're well on your way to completing. So what does the Academy look like? The, the best way to see that is to come visit us in New London, Connecticut. Down in New Jersey, you're not that far away. So I really encourage you to take the chance to come visit. We're a service academy, so the doors are open at any time for you to visit. I do recommend taking advantage of some of our more formal programs that we'll be having in the fall uh, so that you can sit down, go through a formal admissions brief, meet with our students, meet with our faculty and our coaches, and really get that full experience. What I can tell you from here, uh, sitting in New London tonight, we're one of the smallest academies. As was just mentioned, we'll, we'll continue to do that out with the uh, Merchant Marine Academy, but just about a thousand cadets. So you're going to know your classmates on a first name, last name, hometown basis. It's really going to form that family that you'll feel is really the sense of community we have out in the Coast Guard itself being that small service. We represent all 50 states and 20 different nations through our international cadet program. And we're very proud of, of our representation at the academy. Like all the services, we're striving to reflect the diverse populations that the United States is. Uh, it, they, and that starts at the officer corps at home. And very proud to say that we are, as of yesterday, the first uh, military branch to be led by a, a female service chief. So Admiral Fagan, uh, within a ceremony presided over by the, the president yesterday, took over the reins from Admiral Schultz as the commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. And as a, as a classmate of her daughter, uh, I'm really happy to see her uh, take the reins of the service, and I know she'll do great things. Now, you can look online at all our rankings. I, I promise you, just like the other schools, they're good, so I won't spend any time uh, going over that. Like the other schools, we are tuition-free, obviously. We pay you while you're here, uh, but nothing in life comes for free. So you owe that five-year service commitment uh, from uh, in, into the Coast Guard, just like any of the other branches. Now, one thing that sets us apart, and it's a huge takeaway that I want you to have, is, is a little difference in what happens with Coast Guard officers at the end of that five years, and that's our retention rate. 85% of Coast Guard officers choose to stay in the Coast Guard past that five-year service commitment. Now, I don't have the numbers for other uh, service academies or, or civilian institutions, but I can tell you that 85% is, is a little different from, from uh, other institutions and it's something we're very proud of. At that five-year mark, that's also when our officers have the opportunity to go to grad school. So it is about 85% as well of our graduates go on to Coast Guard funded graduate school programs. Your only job while you're at grad school is to go to, uh, is to, go to school. Now, at the academy and in the admissions process, we're focusing on three things just like the other schools, academics, leadership, and, uh, and athletics. So academics, it's going to be STEM-centric, but with a professional focus. I say STEM-centric because you're focusing on likely a STEM or engineering degree. Those are all of our degrees up on that slide. I won't read them off. I'll just let you, you check them out. No matter what you study at the academy, you're going to graduate with your bachelor's of science. And the other big takeaway is no matter what you study, it does not impact what your career is gonna be in the Coast Guard. It absolutely can. If you study uh, like me, I was a government major focusing on law and you wanna to go to law school, you can absolutely do that. I didn't do that. I went afloat for my first assignment like most Coast Guard officers do for their first assignment. Uh, and I've stayed afloat. I've served four years at sea so far and the, this is the first job I've had uh, not on a ship. Most people do not return to sea after their first assignment. But by all means, if you wanna stay as an afloat officer in the Coast Guard, we absolutely have that. Uh, opportunity for you. And I'll go back for one second. The reason that we're, we have a professional focus is even if you do become that lawyer, even if you do go to law school, you're going to get your foundation education in the, in the maritime uh, realm and nautical science. You're going to graduate with your 100 ton master mariner's license uh, so that if you do choose to get out of the Coast Guard, you've got that license to operate in the commercial world. 
Now, after academics, leadership. We're looking to see that you're a leader in your community, in your school, maybe on the field, and we look to see that in your application. And at the academy, we're going to continue to develop you as a leader so that day one, when you graduate, you are ready to take that leadership position, whether that's on an afloat unit, whether that's during flight school, or maybe in a, a command center or at a cyber systems or cyber command uh, assignment somewhere in the world. Finally, all cadets are athletes, whether they're on one of our NCAA Division Three sports, which you'll see on the left side of your screen here, or maybe playing one of our club or recreational or intramural teams, you're going to be an athlete. Now, we recognize that not all students play the you know, traditional football, soccer, uh, even hockey. We recognize that some students do other things to be physically fit. So if rock climbing or surfing or something else is your thing, the academy will work with you and that will count as the athletic credit. Now, similar slide to some of the other academies showed, yes, your day is gonna be very regimented. You're gonna to be told where to be, what, when to be there and uh, what you're gonna be wearing when you get there. But at the end of the day, this is a college. You will have time on your own. You don't have class every second of the day. And if you don't, or if you're not in season, that time is yours to do whatever it is you need to be successful at the academy. Some of the other academies, we do have all the normal offerings, about a hundred different clubs, music and drama activities, tons of campus pride, especially when we play Kings Point with the Secretary's Cup, which hopefully uh, we'll beat them this year. We're, we're going to be playing on their, on their turf and we look forward to that. Uh, and, and then again, just a bunch of different honor, academic and diversity fellowship clubs. Now, if you're not aware, the Coast Guard Academy is located in New London, Connecticut. So really centrally located in Southern New England, about two hours up to Boston, uh, about five minutes down to the beach. And depending on the traffic, about a two to 10 hour drive to New York City. So I always recommend taking the train if you're headed to New York. And obviously for you all down in New Jersey, Amtrak is a great thing to get, uh, to get down there. Now the summers are gonna be, you know, like the other academies, one of your best experiences at the Coast Guard Academy. I'm not gonna go through all the different summers right now because I've got limited time, but you can take a picture of this and send me an email and ask what's coastal sail or, or what's our rules of the road but I promise you'll have fun during your summers. You're gonna get the opportunity to go to operational Coast Guard units anywhere that we have them throughout the world, whether that's along uh, any uh, federally regulated waterway in the US on the East or West Coast, or maybe one of our ships out in the Middle East in Manama, Bahrain. You'll have the opportunities to go there and start seeing the operations that you're gonna be doing as a Coast Guard officer. So that brings me to the careers you'll have. Now we're a little different from the other service academies where when you graduate, you do not graduate into one career path. You're not gonna be labeled right away as specifically a, a, in a float officer or you know, any, any narrow career trajectory. You're gonna have the opportunity to kind of jump back and forth between all the different missions that the Coast Guard does. Because we are so small, you need to be a generalist. Our officers have to be experts at many different things. That's why my, my primary duty right now, my primary specialty is as an afloat officer, but I still get to have assignments like this as an admissions officer, or I still have the opportunity to go to law school and I'll bounce back between my career going afloat, maybe pursuing law or whatever other uh, grad school opportunity that I do pursue. Now, finally, I'll close out with uh, what does it take for the admissions process to the academy? So big difference with the Coast Guard Academy, and I apologize for not mentioning it yet. While we really appreciate the Congressman for having us on here tonight, we do not participate in the congressional nomination process. So when you apply to the Coast Guard Academy, it's just a process with us. The application is fully online. The way you get started, whether you're a freshman, sophomore, or junior, or currently in college or working, I put a link in the chat. You'll click that to make an account. That's the account you'll eventually apply through. Everything is online. We're going to do the medical qualification, similar to the other academies. Only difference is uh, it's a completely independent process. So you might even receive an appointment to the academy before you're found medically qualified. It'll be a conditional appointment. And you'll get that full appointment once that medical process is done. We'll you have your physical fitness exam, a little different from the CFA. Ours is the PFE, uh, mile and a half run, push-ups and sit-ups. And then finally, you'll do all the normal stuff. You'll write some essays. You'll get some recommendations. The one key, if anything says optional on that uh, application, it's not really optional, I highly recommend you do it. Just some critical dates for you on here. If you are a junior, the application is gonna open up on July 15th, so in just about uh, a month. After that, we do run an early action and then a regular admission. So early action will be due in uh, October with the decision coming out around the Christmas holiday. Regular admission due January 15th, and you'll receive your decision. I don't know why we do this, I apologize, but on April 1st, on April Fool's Day, but I promise whatever decision you get, it will be the, the real one. Uh, I'll jump forward. The uh, excited to have our class of 2026 reporting in June 27th to begin their 200 week journey. Now we'll close out here with just some action items for you. 
always important to meet your admissions officer, but you've met me. So congratulations. If you have questions, please reach out via email. Again, my contact is in the chat. Come visit us on campus if you can, or at best take a virtual tour, but sign up for those campus programs when you're able to travel up. Uh, the admissions officers, including myself, will also be down in your area. I always do an event in uh, Atlantic City at our air station there uh, every fall. So please sign up for that and I'll look forward to meeting you in person. And then finally, as was mentioned, uh, we have Mark and Deanna Murdy, parents of a recent graduate from the class of 2020 on board. Uh, similar to Blue and Gold Officers at the Naval Academy, we have an outstanding partner network. We call them admissions partners throughout your area. And the Murdys live in your area. So if you do have questions, take out your phone, take a, take a shot of this. Uh, they can tell, hook you up with their son who's a recent graduate. Also talk to your parents, give them that ever so important parent perspective because they lived it for four years and are continuing to work with us in the admissions office. Uh, but that wraps it up for me. If you do have any questions, I'll look forward to uh, answering them during the Q&A later or following up via email at another time. Thanks. Um, just a real quickie, um, the Bear Den account. The best thing for them to do was to get into the Academy page and, and set themselves up with a Bear's Den account because everything's there. Anything that's going on at the Academy, they get into the system and they can start to rock from there. Yep, thanks, Deanna. And that, that's what I mentioned. That link is right there in the chat. So, so get going with that if you're interested in the academy. Outstanding. All right, great. Thank you to both of you. All right. All right, everyone can see my screen, right? Yes, yes. All right. All right, so as Lieutenant Scott was mentioning, um, you know, there's a nomination portion aspect of it um, for four out of five of the academies. So Coast Guard doesn't require the nomination, but if you're applying for the Naval Academy, West Point, Merchant Marine Academy, or the Air Force Academy, uh, you need to receive a nomination uh, typically from your member of Congress, uh, U.S. Senator, um, or Vice President of the United States. There's also various other uh, nomination sources. <clears throat> okay, so our application uh, for Congressman Norcross's office is directly on our website, norcross.house.gov. Um, so just go to that address and you'll be able to find it under services. So our nomination application is very similar to, you know, the application that you would do to the academy, um, as well as it's very similar to the nomination application for other congressional offices. Um, it's an online form. Uh, it asks for your personal information, education, extracurriculars, hobbies, athletics, work history. Uh, other nominating sources, such as Senator Booker, Senator Menendez, Vice President, et cetera, um, test scores, such as you know, SAT or ACT. Uh, we require three letters of recommendation, a personal statement, high school transcripts, current photo, and a resume. So again, uh, all supporting documents, um, such as like the, the, uh, the test scores, the letters of recommendation, um, personal statement, they should all be sent to uh, norcross.serviceacademy at mail.house.gov. Um, so you can send all those supporting documents to that email address, or if you would like, you can mail them, but typically the easiest way and the quickest way is um, through the email address. Um, and again, high school transcripts and letters of recommendation should be sent to us directly from either the school or the recommender. Um, we don't accept them directly from the student. Yeah, so to summarize, the application is online form and all additional requested documents should be mailed or emailed. Um, please don't send me more than three letters of recommendation. Uh, we require three letters, um, not more than that, not less than that. Yeah. And the full application for the nomination is due uh, October 28th. And if you submit a full um, application to our office, we will invite you for an interview. Uh, in front of the Congressman's um, Service Academy Committee. Typically that is on a Saturday at the beginning of December. 
Uh, and again, um, the full application is due October 28th. And if you have any questions or you would like to set up a meeting, you can feel free to you know, call our office or send me an email and I will be happy to you know, discuss with you any questions that you may have. Hey, Sean, this is Mark Murdy. I just got a question for you. Uh, I see yeah. this is being recorded. Are you going to make this available to everybody that's on watching now? Uh, yeah, we will make it uh, available um, probably on like YouTube or, or something like that. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So in addition, um, on the call today, we also have uh, two uh, students, actually one just recently graduated, but we have uh, midshipman uh, Rowan Suarez Palmer, and we have, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, second lieutenant Trayvon Averhart, who just recently graduated from the uh, uh, Air Force Academy, and Rowan is from the Naval Academy. So if you want to um, unmute yourselves. Hi, Rowan, how are you? Good, how are you? All right, um, so why did you want to attend a service academy and why did you select the academy that you selected? We'll start with you, Rowan. Okay, so um, I was one of the people that went to college first. So I never applied when I was in high school and it actually took me to my sophomore year of college to apply to the academy in general. But um, I knew I wanted to apply to the academy because there's only one place that will get you uh, the leadership opportunities that an academy offers. And you can do ROTC and I was originally planning on doing um, off the candidate school after graduating from college, but it's not the same opportunities that an academy has with um, just leadership classes and just the way that the academies are set up. They're kind of made to create leaders. And that's one thing that everyone stereotypically says, but it's actually incredibly true. By the time you come here, you realize that um, the system with companies and battalions and um, striper positions and things, it really teaches you to be a peer leader, which I think is the hardest type of leader. So once you can do that, you really learn how to like take care of um, people, so. Okay, and Trayvon, why did you wanna attend the Air Force Academy? Hi everyone, hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, the Air Force Academy, it kind of seemed like the best suitable option for career paths in the future for my life. Uh, I understood that there's a lot of opportunities that come with the Academy for job employment. Um, I needed a job regardless of what college I went to and the security of the Academy itself was something that appealed towards me. I definitely want to echo uh, Ryan's rise, I believe is, her name is. Um, the Academy has a lot of opportunities for leadership and it's kind of like no place else uh, where you'll engage in different opportunities with, with cadets, different summer programs, uh, all the things that have been advertised to you guys. You have an opportunity to do a lot of things with your life that you never used to be able to say that you could ever see yourself even doing, so. Great, thank you. And um, so Rowan, what is your advice to someone who is starting the application process? Definitely everyone was saying it, but do the application process early. Um, I couldn't do that. I got hip surgery before coming and before applying that summer. And so I had to push every medical and um, physical aspect of the application, which is a decent amount to the literally last week that you could do it. Um, and that just caused a lot of anxiety and stress and then also delayed then my um, acceptance because of waivers and things. So like I actually didn't find out I was accepted to the academy fully until maybe two weeks before the initial I day. Um, and you just don't want that stress, especially if you are trying to decide a college for the first time and you have that May 1st deadline approaching. You really want to get things done early so that you can have a um, like peace of mind. But um, also with that, like um, the interviews and everything, make sure that you're um, just being like prepared and uh, you like kind of know what you want. Okay, and uh, Trayvon, so what is your advice to someone starting the application process? So the application process is long, uh, tiresome, and definitely we'll see how bad you really want to go to the school if you're choosing. Um, I would definitely say the proactiveness is the number one thing that you can bring into the application process. Apart from that, being your genuine self is the bit most important thing. Um, 
I believe the Academy would like to see, regardless of service Academy, they would like to see people who are truly in it for the right reasons and are looking to become the best version of themselves. So just present yourself as you are in the moment. I myself had a job at McDonald's when I was going through the application process. I was always working with SAT tutors and things of that nature. So just always trying to push yourself to do a little bit more the next day in your free time, knocking out a little bit more of the process. Uh, the application process itself is going to take a lot out of you. Um, however, it's definitely rewarding when you see the little milestones that you've made, when you do your fitness test and things of that nature and trying your best for your best SAT scores, just putting your best foot forward with every step of it is going to get you all the way there. Okay, and uh, I know you touched on this a little bit already, uh, Rowan, but how was the nomination process? And do you have any you know, other interview advice? Um, the nomination process, so the way it's really um, given out is decently simple in the fact that everyone has on their websites, both the schools and um, the Congress and North Boston Senators have a specific tab that really lays everything out. And like you guys do it really well, especially with um, the link to the application and just a written out step-by-step -step process. And so in that sense, it's easy, but um, obviously there's just the anxiety of knowing that there's a lot of people that are required to get it and only certain people can get the nomination. So um, really it, a lot of it comes down to the interview. And then with the interview, if I could give like any advice, it would most definitely be two different things. One, um, as Trayvon was saying, be really genuine. Um, everyone can tell, especially with the board, if you're not sincere with what you want, and if you're not sincere with why you're applying, a lot of people come to the academy is, or a lot of people apply to the academy because they just want to do a certain sport or because they, um, their family went and so they, they feel like they need to go, but make sure you are being genuine with why you want to be there because that always comes forth in your answers and that comes forth like with your truth and so um be genuine be honest about like your life experiences that get you to that instance of, of applying to the academy and then also know what you want um i since i was older i was two years out of college knew that um and they asked um if i was given an, um a naps appointment so i'd have to do that extra year before going i was going to say no because by that point i could just have one year left to college and be an officer within a year and a half um so i decided no like i don't want to do that and things came up for me specifically like would i read the act would i think of going to an nrotc program and i was really honest with people interviewing me that that wasn't something that i would consider this was my only option i really wanted to go to the academy and if i didn't have that like i had other plans backed up but um i think it's nice knowing that you know what you want and they can kind of tell that so definitely like know what you want when you go into the application process and be really open about it. Great, and uh, Trayvon, how was the nomination process? Do you have any interview advice? So for specific interview advice, I would say look sharp, uh, take your time when you talk about the answers that you're about to give. Um, they'll give some challenging questions and that where that's where your prior knowledge and the things you've looked into, make sure you have a little bit of information on the school that you wanna attend so bad, of course. Apart from that, uh, taking time to answer your questions um, in the most full and complete way, looking everybody in their eye, giving a smile, and just saying that you're going to go through this with confidence. Um, it's hard to see when we're younger, we're still trying to figure out who we are, but confidence is going to carry you a long way. And if you're trying and you have the hopes and potentials of being an officer, you have to walk with a little bit of confidence. So that's one thing. Apart from that, I would just say with the whole process in general, keeping a folder, keeping tabs of all the information that you need for the academy um, squared away and having that information on deck handy when needed, that's going to be uh, coming in handy for the couple of months that it takes for the application. Okay, great. Um, and Rowan, what are your career interests or academic interests at the, at the Naval Academy? So I'm still trying to figure out what I want to serve to sign, um, service select. Um, as you heard before, there's a lot of different options, especially at um, the Naval Academy, because you aren't even confined just to the Navy. You can also go into Marine Corps. And so I think I know what I want to do. I would like to fly. Anyone who saw Top Gun recently, obviously most people now want to fly. But um, that's what I would like to do. So I'm right now just researching what possible platform I would like to go into um, and kind of figuring that part out to really see if that's what I want to do. 
And then academic interests, I'm an ocean engineering major. So I am one of the STEM majors at the academy. Um, but I love my major. It's definitely worth what um, the effort that you have to put in. And that's what I actually was majoring in at my old college. And that's why specifically I came to the Naval Academy. I loved my major so much. Okay. And uh, Trayvon, what are your, I mean, you're, you've graduated already from the Air Force Academy. Um, so what are your career interests and, and what, what were your academic interests at the Air Force Academy? Okay. So uh, being one week out of the academy, I can talk about my academic interests and academy interest itself. Um, I was a business administration or management major there. Um, classes were very rewarding. Uh, before there's kind of a stigma saying, oh, if you choose management, it's like an easy cop-out major. But it definitely did make me work and it was very rewarding. One thing I've learned uh, throughout my cadet experience is that you're going to have opportunities and you're going to have to look at college for what it is in that moment. Don't say, I'll use my degree 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line. You use your degree every single day as long as you learn something. So for academic interest, any class that I took, I kind of just went in with an open mind. Um, the, Academy, the Air Force Academy specifically offers a lot of nice elective courses. Me taking sociology the spring of my senior year was probably one of the best decisions I could have had. I feel like I learned a lot. Apart from academic wise, uh, there's a lot of social clubs that they have there and they offer two cadets and you can find, kind of find a niche community for yourself. Career-wise, uh, I was very up in the air about what I wanted to do after the academy. Um, I knew I didn't want to go rated exactly. After doing some of the summer programs, I saw that it wasn't exactly the best fit for me. So I put, on, put in for contracting, and I did end up with logistics. However, I'll be doing uh, admissions for a year. So even with that, with the start of careers, you'll run into different jobs that you have along the way with the military, and you'll find yourself in different situations. And it's going to be very rewarding because you realize your career path itself isn't fully set. It's not just going to be one solid straight line. So I'll do logistics after admissions for a year and we'll see what that entails. But however, it could change into anything. So for right now, I'm just going with the needs of the Air Force. All right, thank you so much. And uh, both Rowan and Trayvon, they were nominated by the Congressman. Um, so they've also gone through our office's nomination process and everything. Um, well, thank you so much for being on. Um, again, this is Midshipman Rowan Suarez of the, of the Naval Academy and second Lieutenant uh, Trayvon Averhart um, from the Air Force Academy. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you again, we appreciate it. Thank you, sir. All right, so at this point in the program, uh, we're gonna open it up to any questions that any of you may have. Um, you can either unmute yourself and ask the question if you would like, or if you wanna send a uh, message to me and I can ask your question to the panel. Hello, I'm Nabil. Um, I recently just graduated from a, like a, a four-year college and I was wondering how to join as an officer in the Air Force. Hey, so that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> the best thing to do is to look for a officer a sessions recruiter um that's probably the uh, the best way that you could do without going through another program uh, rotc the academy and then officer session recruiters are the only three ways how to uh, commission into, into the air force uh, as an officer um but i will tell you uh it's pretty tough um right now they're really only looking for um medical professionals or chaplains and um, other professionals like um, lawyers and, and stuff like that. Um, it is possible uh, to apply for um, OCF or OTS, Officer Training School. Um, like I said, you have to need to find an officer, a sessions recruiter. Um, so the best thing to do is probably just Google to see where, um, where the closest one would be. All right. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Hey, Sean, can I make a point? Yeah, go ahead. Um, for everybody that, that uh, is looking and going to any of the services and you want to do the more than one, 
please stop and have your congressman go and go through all the stuff that Sean's putting out and all the information. The Coast Guard was already stated you do not need one, but our son applied to multiple uh, units and he went and got it anyway. And it was a very good, uh, it's a very good learning process to find out what you're going to need later on. And also like the two uh, people that, are just, that were just up here a minute ago, um, go and look your best. Be prepared, which is going to give you that confidence that you're going to need. Exactly. If anyone had any specific questions, like school no, uh, school related questions, I'd be happy to answer them as well as Rowan, I'm sure. Yes, I'd be happy to answer any questions about the academy. I'm actually currently here right now, so. Um, good evening. I have a question um, about the Naval Academy process and the requirements for the SAT scores. So upon reading on um, the process on their website, I'm getting like conflicting um, requirements as far as the SAT or the ACT scores being um, part of the requirement. I don't know if this was like a past thing where the SAT scores were um, waived due to COVID, but it appeared that still um, saying that it's not a definite thing that's needed, but then I heard this evening that it is. Um, can someone kind of clarify on that? Sean, this is uh, Henry from West Point. All the academies are requiring SAT, ACT scores. Thank you, Henry. Um, this is Martha Christensiano from the Naval Academy. Um, it, you're correct, ma'am. Uh, for the last two cycles, uh, there was a flexible um, policy in which if a student could not take the SATs, um, the, the absence of those scores would, would not jeopardize the rest of the application. But for the class of 2027, test scores are required. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to add to the Coast Guard, uh, just a small correction. The Coast Guard Academy does not require uh, test scores at all. So we started going test optional two years ago, obviously due to the pandemic. Uh, but for those, that reason, as well as just recognizing um, some other data and stats and, you know, equal access and opportunity to testing, we are no longer requiring uh, SAT or ACT scores for Coast Guard. Great. Did you can say the Air Force Academy super scores. I'm not sure which other service academies do that as well, but no, no matter how often you do take the SAT or the ACT, the academy is always going to take your highest score for each category. Um, so we definitely encourage um, taking both tests. Uh, some people just do better on one test versus the other one, whether it's how they're written or how they're scored or anything like that. Uh, so we do encourage taking both tests early and often, figure out which one you like the best, and then uh, taking it a couple different times to try to get the best scores. Great. All right. And the other thing I just want to reiterate again in regards to the nomination process, um, our application is due October 28th. Um, and our interviews typically will take place usually the first Saturday of December. Um, and if you have a full application that is into our office by October 28th, um, we will invite you for an interview. So definitely be sure you familiarize yourself with the requirements. Um, reach out to me if you have any questions at all, and I will be willing to assist you with anything. All right. Any other questions from the audience? All right, I think Dakota, you have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, for the Naval Academy, are reapplicants considered for NAPS and foundation schools if they do not receive uh, LOAs or um, direct deployments? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Christiana. Good to see you. You too. All right, anyone else? Going once. I have a question. All right, go ahead. Uh, question for Trayvon, Lieutenant Trayvon. Uh, what were some of the things that you did at the academy? Uh, some of the extracurriculars that you did outside of your degree? Okay, so that goes way back into like my whole uh, 
I'm going to come here and be a shell and be a turtle and stay out the way because I felt that was going to be the best way. But uh, throughout that process, I soon learned that the friendships that you make and stuff are going to force you into different things. So my sophomore year, uh, I didn't have anything to do. And one of the friends I had met uh, from the semester prior, he got me to be a football manager for the Falcons. So I was able to go to Hawaii within like one season of being a manager for football. So that was my extracurricular there. I was uh, in the Wave Life Club, um, apart from just school and uh, regular academics or training sessions, I decided to be a DO for a semester, director of operations. And essentially what that is, is just more leadership experience within the squadron that you live in around the people that you're living with. So it's really hands-on. It comes with a lot of hours and getting to know different people, as I'm sure you know already, sir. But that was uh, that was pretty much it for me. Did either you or um, Midshipman um, Suarez, did either of you guys go to the your uh, prep schools, designated prep schools? I was fortunate enough to not have to do that, actually. I believe that happened because my dad, he had served 20 years, so I was able to get one extra nomination. Um, so I was fortunate enough to not have to go to the prep school, but you'll see when you do go to the academy, there's sometimes a slight divide between people who went to the prep, uh, preparatory school and then the people who went directly in. But fortunate enough for me, the people that I found myself being friends with all the time were people who went to the preparatory school. So definitely just get some of their knowledge from them. Uh, when you go through basic training, they're going to know almost everything. So Definitely good people to have around you um, and people who can give you different perspective than your own being a direct, so. Um, additionally, I did not go to the prep school either, but my cousin, who's currently a Coastie, the class of um, 23, he did go to the Naval Academy prep school. And um, so I kind of have a inside look about the uh, prep school. And I know that he has a bunch of friends that we even spent Thanksgiving with at the Naval Academy, other uh, new now, Naval Academy midshipman, but he's a Coastie. And so he went to um, Naval Academy Prep School and um, his friends were with us for Thanksgiving. I spent a lot of time talking to them and their prep school experience is um, sometimes, it's hard being told that you have to go to prep school, but I know people come out of there um, stronger than they could have come in as a direct. And actually it's a really big benefit for them. I know that was for my um, cousin and it's really a great resource for us who come in with no knowledge. I remember my first roommate was a prep school kid. So they taught me how to fold everything correctly during plebe summer. And you really um, utilize those people because they learn a lot of things and know them coming in before you do. So they're really a great resource and um, it's actually a really great opportunity to develop both either physically or academically. Thanks guys. All right, great, thank you. Any other questions? No? All right, I just wanna say thank you um, to all of our presenters tonight, um, to Rowan, to Trayvon. Um, it was really a great informative uh, presentations tonight. Um, and if anyone in the audience has any questions, they can always uh, reach out to me uh, at the Congressman's office. I provided my email and phone number in the chat. Um, and I can also connect you with any uh, one of these representatives. Um, so again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, we're always happy to help. Um, with that, um, this concludes the program for tonight. Have a great rest of your evening.